Hey, what's up, my friends? Graham Baldwin here. Welcome back to the Speak Lab podcast. So good to have you here with us today. Whether you're a brand new speaker, you're just getting started, you just don't know what you don't know, or you're someone that's been at this for a little while and you're trying to figure out how do you continue to scale up your speaking business, continue to multiply your income and your impact. We are glad that you are here today. Today, we've got a, a great guest for you. This person is a, a legend in the speaking industry. Today, we're going to be talking with Nancy Duarte. Now, Nancy is the author of several books, Slideology, Resonate, illuminate her most recent book, uh, Data Story. And so uh, she is very prolific in the world of speaking and presentations and slides and stories. So we get into all of that. We get into how she got into this world. It's a very fascinating story of, uh, of how she got into it. She's been at this for a long time, has worked with some big, big, big names. In fact, so much so that uh, one of the things I ask her, she couldn't even contractually answer uh, that big of a name. So I, I think you're going to like that. We talk about slides and when you should and shouldn't use slides. We're going to be talking about rules and guidelines for slides, common mistakes that speakers make whenever using slides. We also spend a lot of time talking about stories and how to use stories, how to craft stories, how to deliver stories, what makes stories so powerful and so compelling. We talk about if you're going to be using data in your presentation, how to incorporate that in an interesting and compelling way. And then also we have a, uh, <laughs> a random happening that you will not be able to see, but you'll be able to hear all about. So, so um, you'll, you'll know it when you hear it. So it makes a good uh, analogy for slides. So you'll hear that uh, in the first few minutes here. So let's get right into this conversation with Nancy Duarte. Enjoy. Hey, what's up, friends? Graham Baldwin here. Welcome back to the Speaker Lab podcast. Today, joined by Nancy Duarte, who's the author of Slideology, Resonate, Illuminate, and most recently, Data Story. So we're going to get to all of that, I am sure. But Nancy has been in the uh, the speaking industry for speaking industry, presentation industry for many, many years. And 100 so we years. A hundred, hundred years. Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> But some days we have a lot to cover today. So Nancy, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to chat with us. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. It'll be fun. So today you run and operate Duarte. You guys uh, mm -hmm. seem to do a lot of training and, and presentation development, especially in mm -hmm. the corporate space. I'm curious, let's go way back in time. How did you even get into the world of speaking and presentations? Yeah, I, I would love to say this place found me, that I found it, but it found me. So I actually... My dirty little secret is I got a C minus in speech communication in college <laughs> and a D in English, and now I write books in English about speech communication. But it got it was really discouraging. It was super discouraging for me. I was only eighteen, and I did what any bright young person does at that age: is I got married instead of finishing my college degree. <laughs> Highly recommend that. And so my husband actually started the business. We were probably the only people in about a two mile radius of our little pitiful apartment that had a Macintosh at the time. That was like a big deal. Not everyone owned one back then. And uh, he started doing technical illustrations. So he's a fine artist. And so I joined him about two years later, just kind of peddling his wares. I picked up the phone one afternoon and we won NASA Tandem, which is now HP and Apple all in one afternoon. One and afternoon? Thought, yeah, yeah. It was easy Holy back cow. then. Like you're such a young wee pup. You probably don't realize that. Like back then, NASA say, you took electrical tape and an X-Acto knife to make a data chart. Like you cut the little axes, you used wow. the rub on letters. So we were quite the like di disruptive little digital art upstart, right? We were like displacing these long-term drafting companies. Anyway, Apple was such a blessing because in 92, they had a layoff, which maybe for them wasn't a blessing, but for my business, it sure was. So they all, my biggest department at Apple just scattered like beautiful seeds all across the Bay Area and they all took us with them. And Apple was wow. the first company to hook up a projector to a computer at scale. People don't realize like that wasn't a thing back then. Yeah. So they were way into projected slides and it just, we spread at the right time. So we got niched in slides pretty early in 90 when we won Apple. We were doing work with them in 88 and 89. We did their one of their first big developers conferences at scale. So, wow. so yeah. hindsight, you just feel like you were right place, right time, uh, right solving, place, right solving time. A, a problem. Yeah, it's our 31-year anniversary with Apple. We've worked with them every single year since, yeah. That's Quite amazing. Quite partnership, yeah. Do you still, like a lot of the, the big launches, the product launches for, you know, iPhones and any of those products, do you help develop a, a lot of the, what yeah, we, we see on stage, behind the stage? We can't talk about the work we do for Apple. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not allowed to be explicit, but they're our largest account, so. Yeah, that's fun. fun. All right, yeah, very cool. Way fun. So, so you're, you're helping, even back then, back in the, the late 80s, 90s, are you helping them People can't see. You are just dabbling with your hair. Your hair you is fine. What, it what, is? Are you, what are you doing? You know, 
You know what it is? Only you can see me on this podcast. I've got that big helicopter headset thing, and my hair is coming out of it like 12 ways from Sunday. You are, you are so worried about that. <laughs> see, this is why, again, people well, can't see, but they, if I those who are familiar with me, I, I, I shave my head, and it's just so much simpler that way. I know. I'm, hi- I'm hiding myself now because I can't stand. It's like this twitching bee. Like, you know how it is when you stand up and <laughs> it's like when you <laughs> present, right? And you've got this person doing jumping jacks in the corner. That's how my hair looks. It looks like jumping jacks or something. It's fine. It's <laughs> fine. People are going, I wish I, I, I told you I'm not going to share the video, I but know, uh, I know. we'll let people kind of uh, imagine in their mind what, what your hair is doing. <laughs> So wipe so, that smile off your face. You can so, see my hair right now. <laughs> so you're you're creating presentations. There's the word I'm going for with Apple and all these major corporations. At what point are you? It sounds like at the beginning it was just kind of I'm just kind of dabbling this. We're just kind of playing with this. Mm-hmm. At what point are you realizing like this is something I want to do long term and there's a real yeah. need here in the marketplace? I think you know when you're first an entrepreneur, you you, it's feast or famine, and you keep telling yourself, "Oh, the phone's not going to keep ringing." And we really felt like, man, if you give really, really great service, we just served them. Like if they wanted something super ugly right there in the middle of their slide, we'd give them something ugly on their slide. Like we let them just tell us what they wanted, and eventually, you know, we became the experts, and they they deferred to us. I remember there was this day where we actually did a project at Apple, actually, it was in this little tiny triangle room, and the whole team got up to leave. So we worked from home up to that point in time. And I remember packing up my briefcase at the time, which people don't carry anymore, packed up my briefcase, and I said, I'm going home. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going home. Like I had been working from home, but I never got to leave work. I was at work, I was at home, I was at work, I was at home, and it was just this pervasive thing. So I think we'd been working from home for about six years, and we had five employees come into the house. And we just decided, you know what, we're going to go big, man. We're going to go real big. And we got ourselves an office space. I think that was really the day where we were like, oh my gosh, this is a five-year lease. We're going to have to commit to this for five more years, right? So I think small businesses make major strategic decisions every time their lease comes up for renewal because you got to commit to big or flat or small or whatever. And so I feel like that was the day where I realized, oh my gosh, I want to have an office I go to and I want to have a home that's my home. And that was our biggest commitment that we made at the time was to get an office, yeah. So you'd been working again, in the industry for, for many, many years, it seems like outside looking in, it seems like whenever you released Slideology, which would have been what, 2007? Eight, Eight? 2008. Okay. Mm-hmm. So book comes out, seems like things that really, uh, that, what did that do for you? It seemed like that really took things off or really propelled things? Yeah, it definitely did. I thought I just wrote a book, right? I just put it out there because we'd been doing it for so long. And in 2000, we decided to become experts in just presentations. So we closed all our other services and we just did presentations and nobody really was doing that at the time. And so by the time uh, it came time to write Cytology, we were experts at what we were doing. And I was really encouraged by my friend Gar Reynolds. He wrote a book called Presentation Zen. And he kept bugging me, Nancy, you write everything I left on the cutting room floor of my book, right? So he kept sending me early drafts and I wrote everything that he didn't address in his book. So that's why I, we kind of both promote each other's books. And what happened was the phone started to ring for training and I wasn't expecting that. And that's when we built this other business unit where now we train people, train people how to uh, not only write, but visualize and then deliver through coaching their decks that's just been so fun. Like we could, we could make your deck for you and that's great. And you might look like a rock star and be all frothy about how good you did. But when you teach someone to do it for themselves, I mean, you're really changing the world at at scale. And so that's been really, 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 really fun. Really fun. One of the the topics that we've discussed quite a bit on this show with a variety of different speakers, uh, and I have my own two cents, but I'm curious on, on your opinion here is that the pros and cons of using slides. Because there's a lot of speakers who absolutely swear by them. There's certainly a lot of upside. There's also a lot of risk and challenges that can be associated from a tech standpoint or otherwise with slides. Mm -hmm. So give us your potentially biased perspective on the (laughs) the slides and the, again, the, the pros and cons, the ups and downs of using slides, whether speakers should be using them. Yeah, I think the order that where you should put your energy and the order of importance is content delivery and then slides always. So even though we create a lot of them, they're a visual aid 
really is what they are. They're a visual aid, a backdrop, a concept, a shocking statistic. Like it's supposed to be, it's not a character in your story. It's the backdrop of what you're trying to say. Now, granted, slides are used in a lot of other ways too, as slide docs, which means you create a dense document that'll circulate around an organization. And those are brilliant. It's a brilliant way to communicate, but I think people misuse it. And I think and what happened was a lot of presenters use their slides as a teleprompter. And so instead of like you're projecting what you're going to say, they're practically yeah. projecting their script. And that is and will always be the wrong thing to do because the human brain can't handle two channels. They can't listen to you talk and put something in front of them that you're expecting them to read. I mean, yeah. brain science shows they can't do both even though I claim I can, I can't. And so I appreciate that you stopped laughing at my hair. I appreciate it looks, that. It looks lovely. It looks lovely Did I the smooth whole time. it out? It was like Broomhilda or something. <laughs> it was terrible. Anyway, yeah, so I think that, I think that if you can verbal, verbally communicate and demonstratively be dynamic and passionate and empathetic, that's a big win. And then slides are a way for people to have common understandings about what you're saying. So if there's yeah. a model, like if you're showing relationships through a model or a mental model that you want them to remember or an image or, or something like that, then, it, then a, a visual does speak a thousand words. But you yeah. just need to be super selective and make it have impact. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things we, we tell speakers all the time is if a slide should be an enhancement, not a replacement for your talk. Exactly. And so like exactly. you said, if it's if it's a teleprompter or a, a way to think about it is five minutes before you're supposed to go up and the slides don't work and the technology breaks down, yeah. your talk should still stand on its own. And exactly. if it's like, well, I can't give my talk without my slides, well, then your talk isn't ready. Exactly. Uh, and so it should absolutely be that enhancement. So if speakers are going to use slides, because like you said, uh, whether it's a, a visual image or a stat or a, a model of some form, there's some things that that you can't verbally articulate. People can't visually right. picture your hair right now. And <laughs> if I just describe it, you describe it, it doesn't do justice versus if someone can actually see it, right? This is making a great point. We're going to yeah, turn this into I mean, something here. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I agree. So if people are going to use slides, what are the, the rules and guidelines that we should be following? Well, first of all, they need to be simple. They shouldn't have so much content on it that it takes them forever to process it visually. Yeah. Kind of like how my hair is visually overwhelming. Yeah, it should not be visually overwhelming. So basically, they should amplify your message and that content is king. So you shouldn't have flourishes or like ornamental things or just for ornamentation's sake. It should be very clear what's the main point you're trying to get across visually um, so that people don't have to process multiple things at once because you're trying to keep you know, their brains focused on your verbal stream. Um, so, At what point do slides become not necessarily even an enhancement, but they become a distraction for an audience? So the brain will process anything that moves. So I think people that get a little too clever in their animations, like animations too need to have meaning. So you can have, yeah, it's easy to put a static image up there, but once it starts to move, you, you could use that to your advantage. So you could use time to your advantage and it can be amazing, or you can use time and it be a massive distraction and it be a poor use of, of distraction. So I think that, can you remember why I said all that? Because you asked a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> where, where it becomes a distraction instead oh, yeah, of an enhancement. Yeah. yeah, I think too, the other thing that's super interesting is some people will complain about scientists and engineers and how complex their slides are. Or like people who speak at biotech conferences or pharma companies and they're like, oh my God, your slides shouldn't be that dense. Well, if you think about someone in pharma or engineering, they have a visual shorthand that means mm -hmm. the same across all engineers. And so what might seem complex to a novice may not seem complex to someone solving cancer, right? So if you're, right. Cancer, if you're solving cancer and you're talking to a room of other scientists solving cancer, what looks like something complex to you and they, is not too complex for that audience. They know immediately how to process something at the logarithmic scale, you know, for them it's shorthand. But if you're talking to a group of breast cancer survivors, you better not show these very complex, rigorous, researchy kind of, kind of bits. So it's a lot about know your audience and know what, how much they know about your subject matter and feed it to them in a way that they receive information um, and adapt um, mm -hmm. to a broad audience so they understand what you're trying to say. You touched on it, but what, what are some other uh, common mistakes that you see that speakers make whenever it comes to using slides? Man, the list is endless. I think they don't necessarily highlight uh, the most important thing, make it too complex. They don't have empathy and understand who they're speaking to. 
I think there's a lot of visual complexity, but I also think that if people really understood how to use shapes and the relationships between shapes, that's why I wrote Diagrammer. So Diagrammer is a tool where you can understand how things are related to each other. So if, you have, if you're talking about three things and you're making a point about three things, those three things have some form of a relationship with each other. They may overlap. They may converge. They may diverge. They may. There's all kinds of ways those three, those three things may be related to each other. So instead of just putting three circles up there and say it's three things, you should really think through how are these things related and can I put those three things into a model or a framework mm-hmm. so that the audience will understand more clearly what I'm trying to say. And because sometimes those three things, when they combine, they might impact something else and drive change or, you know, there's just different ways that you need to really think through what you're trying to say. And any time you can turn words into a picture or words into a diagram or words into a chart or data into a chart, you should do it as much as possible. And in a data story, nobody had ever done this, but I made an annotation section where I show you how to you plot a chart and then you have to go in with your drawing tools and overlay findings or math or amplify the point by overlaying through a certain taxonomy to create meaning on top of a chart. And that helps the audience process data really quickly too and get to the point. Mm-hmm. So uh, from a speaker's perspective, is there any best practices on when or when you shouldn't use slides, meaning that I have a, a 45 or 60 minute presentation, a keynote presentation, how many slides is, is too many? I, I have the story that feels like I could use a bunch of slides or maybe it's more effective and more powerful to use no slides. Any rhyme or reason that as a speaker, I'm working yeah, on my talk I, and I'm just trying to figure out where slides do or don't make sense. The thing I would love would be like, if you ever notice like, college graduations, they don't use slides. Politicians don't use slides, right? I think it's because they craft their words so well. Dr. King, I sometimes wonder if he had slides, would that speech have been so beautiful? Like he had to use his words in a really descriptive and profoundly beautiful way Mm -hmm. to get his message across. So I would love if people crafted their words really beautifully and then decided what would be better to have slides or not. We worked with a Hollywood guy who had a... uh, saying it was a reality show is too strong, but it was kind of a, if I, if I said what it was, you guys would figure it out. But anyway, he, he worked with people who had problems and then he realized he wasn't really being honest because they'd be like, well, you have it all together and we don't. And, and what was interesting is he wanted to become clean about his own addiction that he had, his own, his own problems. And he wanted to do a very emotional and serious talk about that. It didn't seem right to have slides. It just didn't seem right. Mm -hmm. And so while he talked and told this personal story, we started and it was dark. It it was like dark, the lighting. And then it, it went to the full spectrum of the colors of daylight and then all the way back to darkness and then day again. It was so beautiful. And all we did is change the lighting in the room, no slides. No slides at all. But there was a moment in time where the whole audience is in utter just darkness. It just goes dark. And that was so much more powerful to do that than it was to have all these slides, you know, and and it was just really, really powerful. So I use slides um, because most of the time I'm trying to get people to see what's in my head. And I also tend to use slides as bite-sized little atomic devices for me to structure, almost like post-it notes. Mm-hmm. So um, when, my, when I'm working, and my husband, he just dies laughing. He goes, oh, you're slide sortering again. Like I'm always in slide sorter mode. I'm never in slide making mode. I'm always going into slide sorter, looking at the structure, and then going into a slide, backing up, looking at the bigger structure. And so I'm always looking at the sum and its parts all the time. I'm just never looking at slides in a linear fashion because I actually am making a narrative as I'm assembling them, almost like you would sticky notes. So I start there. I start with my structure, put it in slideshow mode, slide sorter mode, long before I start to even draw or write or anything. Interesting. You touched on the that example of someone using uh, the lighting as a way to mm-hmm. d- deliver their talk. That was really fascinating because yeah. uh, you don't see a lot of speakers do that. You know, it's occasionally mm-hmm. you'll see speakers that may use uh, some background music or some some sound effect or something. But mm-hmm. uh, just tapping into the different senses. I remember a speaker years ago told me a story about how everybody in the audience had like a like a program or conference guide or something, and he's told a story about his grandpa, and he's they sprayed like old spice. That cologne on all of them. So people are, are holding the guides. He's telling the story and people are like, 
it reminds me of my grandpa. My grandpa. You know, it's, not like the, it's like he's here, you know, yeah. um, mm-hmm. but just tapping into some of those different senses. And one yeah. of those obviously We've being, you know, visually yeah. with, with slides. So it's expensive touch- to pipe. We've looked into that because there's always like some sort of olfactory experience you can have yeah. and piping fragrances into rooms is a thing. Um, and designing a fragrance is tough because we, we had done that too for a, uh, a company that makes pipes and and we took earth and pipe and all these different things because they were doing them in sustainable material and you could actually tell the difference in the chemicals by just smelling so we had the whole room have these things and they did smell different bits i um, mean it was fascinating and it actually helped them um in the end it was really fun to to work on that because it was our idea not that many people want to go the sniff route right right it's kind of rare to get a client to buy off on it and it's also isn't smell like the uh, the mm-hmm. sense that's most associated with memory. Yep. Yep. Like I had uh, white wine the other night. I smelt it and I was just like, it's freaking marzipan. I'm like, this is marzipan. <laughs> I can smell the marzipan. And my wow. husband's like, cause yeah, my olfactory skills are strong. So I Googled it and sure yeah. enough, that's one of the notes in this wine was marzipan, but it, wow. it, it was weird. It was almost like in my mind, my brain did that. What is it like when you reverse a cassette tape? It went, and I remembered the first time I ever, and I remembered the scene. I could see everything the first time I tasted marzipan. It was crazy. Interesting. It does that. It does that, yeah. You mentioned um, Martin Luther King's speech as an example Mm -hmm. of something that was an extremely powerful speech that did not use any slides or technology. Do you have any examples of TED Talks or otherwise of like, this is an amazing, amazing example of if someone wants to see how to use slides in an extremely effective, enhanced way, definitely go check out this talk. Is there any examples that come to mind? Yeah, I think that Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, he mm-hmm. did a good job. Um, that's kind of the obvious one. I think the way Steve Jobs And you worked on that, that project, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we worked with him five years before it was the hope of a movie. And then a couple of years after it became a movie or after the movie. And so I think he did an effective use of them because it was a lot of data. And it, and it was so weird because a lot of people were like, wow, we've never seen data presented clean like that. I think Steve Jobs presented and used slides like it's very dramatic. I love toward the end of, and even the Steve Jobs pavilion, the actual auditorium, Steve Jobs auditorium has seamless to the ground. Like it's literally, there's the stage and then behind him at the level of their feet is the whole entire backdrop. Like the whole entire stage just takes up the whole wall. So beautifully done. Um, And I do feel like Tim Cook has taken it forward in a really interesting way. And he plays the role of what I would call a curator. So he's not necessarily the key presenter, but he's the master of ceremonies, bringing the other presenters in. I think that's effective. I actually think that Mark Benioff is doing a really good job too. He's working hard to become a strong presenter. And I think a lot of his stuff has meaning, but their brand by its nature has all these characters and all this kind of, these characters do things and they become kind of part of the story. Um, So they're brand right now is very illustrative and illustrated characters and stuff like that. So I think people are getting a lot better at it. And almost every TED talk, like you can't get on the main TED stage with cruddy slides anymore. They go through a massive vetting process now. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned Mark as someone who is a good speaker, trying to become a better speaker. Do you feel like, and and you, you've worked with a lot of speakers. You mentioned that you, that Duarte as a company does a lot of training with executives and helping them become Mm -hmm. better speakers. Do you feel like just in general that, that speakers are are born or are they made or can a, a good speaker become a great speaker? What, What are your thoughts on that? I love that question. You know, I think that, I mean, not to go full stereotypical on you, but I think people who are naturally extroverts, aren't as afraid to get on the stage, but that does not mean they're the brightest people on the earth, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can get a deep thinking introvert to be comfortable presenting, they're actually the best ones because they won't get up and wing it ever. They will always get up and have very intentional word choices, very intentional constructs to what they're trying to say. So I actually think um, introverts that get brave enough to communicate are actually the finest presenters um, because they'll craft. They'll actually do the deep thinking to do the crafting. I think a lot of extroverts will wing it. So I think if you can get an extrovert to become a deep thinker or you can get a deep thinker to be comfortable on the stage, those are the finest. That's interesting you say that because this is a theme that's come up several times is a lot of speakers that we've talked to, myself included, are we feel very introverted and that Mm -hmm. we enjoy being on stage. We enjoy being in front of an audience, but also have no problem being by ourselves and being in the silence of a a hotel room or backstage or in an airport or wherever it may be. I hate that when people call you for a talk and they're like, and then we want you to come to drinks the night before (laughs) and then we set up a breakfast thing for you. 
And then when you got to walk our show floor and you're just like, oh my God, I, I don't just want to do any of those things. I'd rather sit in my room and watch Downton Abbey. I did that once. And <laughs> watched four episodes and hid in my room and told them I had plans and couldn't do it. <laughs> I had plans. Mm -hmm. I would love to be there, but I have a, I have a, <laughs> I have a very uh, important a commitment. meeting tonight. <laughs> yeah. So slides is obviously one of the big things that you are known for. Another uh, thing that you're really well known for is, is stories. And so your new mm -hmm. book, Data Story, talks about how to take a lot of the, the you mentioned, uh, whether it's a science or pharma or engineering or some of these like kind of data driven. I, I remember listening to a, a podcast interview a couple of weeks ago with a guy who is a, an entrepreneur, but he's primarily a, a coder. And so he was talking about when he speaks, it's incredibly helpful for him to show code, yep. even though to, to you and I, potentially non-coders, that it may just be gibberish and confusion, but it was incredibly helpful in that situation. So mm -hmm. can you kind of give us what's the, the premise behind uh, data story and how can we share data in a, in a compelling way for an audience. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that there's a lot of data and data is everywhere. And so we have a lot of people that can explore the data. And when you explore the data, one of two things happens. You either find a problem or you find an opportunity. Once you're dug through the data and you found that problem or an opportunity, then you have a communications problem, right? Now you have to communicate what you found. And that kind of goes to the uh, discussion we were just having. Not everyone who can do the deep thinking in the data is naturally wired to also communicate it. And so this book starts where the data kind of stops and says, okay, if you found a problem or an opportunity, how do you communi communicate it? Because you either need to explain it or you need to inspire through it. So this takes, how do you make a recommendation from data in the form of a story? And then also, how do you make that data stick and inspire others to take action? Because normally when you find a problem or you find an opportunity, you're going to need people to take action because of that. And most of us speak, and most of us executives anyway, internally, you have to present in a really inspiring way so people will solve the problem found in the data or they will take action from the opportunity found in the data. So it's a lot about how to get people to move and take action because of findings in the data. And so is the best way to do that through the medium of story? Yeah, it actually is. So you can actually apply the three-act structure. So the three-act story structure, it's not story like fiction. Like, yeah, take your data and make it fake. Like turn it into fake. It's not that. It's not fiction. It's not fables. It's not fairy tales. When I say story, I talk about like the, the structure of a story. Like brain science now shows that we can hook, now that we can hook up an fMRI machine to the brain, you can see how the brain fires when a story is being told. And it fires in a way it doesn't fire under any other condition other than a story and all the sensing parts of the brains light up so just think of how powerful it is if you just use the framework of a story to shape the recommendation you're making people will remember it they'll recall it and it'll even have a small emotional arc to it you're still just stating the data but you're framing it in a completely different in a three-act structure which is super a powerful way to do it might as well fire up the brain while you're talking about data there's no harm in that you kind of touched on it there, but why is it that stories are so effective and so powerful and one of the best tools and resources that, that any speaker can use, whether it's a, a data-driven talk or not? A story is emotional. So what happens is there's a rise and fall in story. There's a rise of tension and a fall, and it rises and falls. And that there's an emotional catharsis in that. There's this sense of, well, am I like that? Oh, well, I would avoid that roadblock. Like you're comparing yourself to the protagonist in the story, trying to decide if you would make the same moral and physical decisions. So the, the protagonist is on an inner journey, which is the journey of their heart that is changing while the story's going on. And they're on an outer journey. They're trying to climb their way to Sauron. Like there's a physical journey and an emotional journey. And the whole time a story's happening, we are going on that journey with that person. And so there is empathy. It's a natural vehicle for empathy. So we say story is the vehicle to empathy. Like it, they're not one in the same. Story is kind of the channel that gets you to this empathetic place. And story, interestingly, if you're a speaker, and you choose to tell a story, or if you're a leader and choose to tell a story, something really special happens in your bond with the audience. So brain science would also sh show you that when you're telling a story as a speaker, the audience's brains are firing in the exact same order as your brain is firing it while you're telling it. Mm 
And something happens in the perception of someone when they're willing to take a risk and tell a personal story, especially one from a stage. Because the natural structure of a story is that there's a messy middle. In a movie, 10% is the beginning, 80% is the middle, and 10% is the end. So 80% is happening when all the action's going on. There's these roadblocks and you're cheering for them and you're having this rise and fall of emotion and all this excitement's happening. Well, If you're going to tell a story, you're going to share your messy middle. And a lot of times that messy middle means you expose that you're flawed and you expose that life is hard. And when you expose that you're flawed and life is hard, the emotional connection of the audience to you is going to be unparalleled than should you not choose to tell a story. So they'll root for you. They'll they'll perceive you as transparent and they'll perceive you as authentic when you tell a true three-act structure and you go straight to the fact that there's a messy middle and that life is hard and that you've overcome something. And so because of all of that, do you think that first person stories are more effective or more powerful than third person stories? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now I think a third person story told at the right time is, is very effective, but a personal story told from a place of conviction comes with a different sense of reality. Like you could tell a story about D-Day, you know, Mm -hmm. a historical account of Lincoln getting shot at Ford Theater, right? But if you tell a personal story about you getting shot, it's just completely different. And and yeah, a personal story told from a place of personal conviction because of the moral of the story or because the overcoming in it, super powerful. So since the most effective stories are those first person stories, I know a lot of times speakers have a difficult time balancing, look at this story, look how I overcame this obstacle, woe is me, look at me, versus doing it in service of the audience. So how do you find that that balance of, uh, I'm telling a first person account, but I want to make sure that I connect the dots of how it relates Mm -hmm. to you and how you as an audience member can apply that. Any any thoughts there? Yeah, you know, and to reframe it a bit, there's I stories, like I did this, there's we stories, we did this. This, and then there's they stories. Those, that's how we differentiate between, you know, first, second, and third person. So there's like I stories and we stories work close to the same as say a third person story is a little bit more distanced from that. Mm-hmm. We had an executive who became the number one most loved executive on Glassdoor, which is just crazy. And a lot of it is because he embraced storytelling. So what he used to do is get up and he would tell a story like, I was kind of patting his own back verbally, self-aggrandizing. Like, I was awesome at my old job. This is what I did, my old job. I'm awesome. You know, it was always like, everything is awesome and I am awesome. (laughs) And we asked him, we said, you know, we really, you're getting feedback that you're not authentic and transparent. You're, let's tell a story. So he told a story at an internal meeting and it was simple. It wasn't even that of an embarrassing, it was just like, hey, I came in here kind of hot and I did this project and it failed. I mean, it wasn't even emotional. It wasn't even that much more than that. It was a little longer and unpacked. And his response to this was unbelievable. Best talk ever. Like everything else was kind of the same. He inserted this one story about, you know, coming into the org hot and, and having a failure and the amount of affection for him for just doing that at a public company, which is kind of harder to do, right? Because that can drive stock value. Mm-hmm. But now he's really embraced storytelling and is starting to really people are getting very, very fond of him. And he stopped telling the self-congratulatory stories and told it is now telling stories of, of failure and overcoming to encourage others to tell their stories and, and overcome also, or to learn from his mistakes too. Part of the challenge with telling first person stories is what you kind of perceive as your own story may not be that it, you perceive it as not being interesting or why would someone be yeah. interested in this? I, I came into this company and I had a failure, not a big deal. Everybody has failures, but to the audience, they're like, wow, that was a huge aha light bulb, you know, mm-hmm. moment. So how do you determine whether or not a story is worth sharing? So if you look at a story as a small atomic part of a larger presentation. You could use it, you could use multiple small stories, little anecdotes throughout Mm -hmm. your talk, or you could use a story as a thread where you keep coming back. Like you start your talk and then you tell a part of a story and then you keep going and you tell another part of the story and you kind of use it as a thread. I think everyone should use at least one small personal story so that the affection of the audience is warmed up to you. It's just an important credibility and likability device. 
Yeah. Yeah, the, the, we tell speakers that- An the, empathy device, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, well, just that you're, mm. you're a human talking to a collection of other humans. Exactly. And, and we relate to, you know, if I share a story about my first car, well, everybody in the audience had a first car. And so we mm. know it could be something, you know, silly. It could be something, you know, uh, inspirational or impactful, but we, we can all relate. We, we, we relate to and we connect with, with, uh, with, with stories from other humans. So Exactly. Incredibly powerful. Exactly. Well, Nancy, I want to be respectful of your time. I've really enjoyed this conversation. If people want yeah, to find out too. more about you and check out uh, your latest book, uh, Data Story, where can we go? Yeah, you can go to Duarte.com, D-U-A-R-T-E. I also am on Twitter at Duarte and at Nancy Duarte. And I do connect to everyone who connects to me on LinkedIn. So awesome. that's a good way too. Yeah. Very cool. Nancy, thanks for the time. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a bunch. All right, there you go. Hope you enjoyed that conversation with Nancy Duarte. Again, uh, I definitely would encourage you to pick up any of her books, but especially her latest book, Data Story. And as a, you may have heard us talk about before, we actually have a new book ourselves coming out called The Successful Speaker. It's going to be out in February, a few months from now, uh, depending on when you're listening to this. But we're going to be offering a phenomenal pre-order uh, offer coming up soon. So make sure you be on the lookout for that. We're going to re release that around uh, Black Friday. So uh, get ready for that, my friends. The Successful Speaker coming out soon. Thanks for hanging out with us and uh, we'll catch you next time. You're awesome.